up, what's up, what's up? Hey, today is yet another day, and you know which day it is, my favorite day of the week. It's Sunday, and we get to praise God together. Come on, let's go. Come on, put your hands together. Hey, come on, put your hands together. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. Here we go. We praise you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Yes, we adore you. Yes, everybody say, Father, 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 Father. We praise you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Yes, we adore you. Yes, we do. Say, Father, Father. Father, Father, we praise 
me sing it. Say, na kungo cha, na kungo. We wait on new Lord. New wishes. Somebody raise your voice and give the Lord a mighty shout of praise. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Indeed. Our Father, we wait on you. We wait on you to satisfy us, to, to fill us up to overflow. Your word talks about how you will never leave us nor forsake us, how you lead us on paths of righteousness and allow us to drink of life-giving waters. I pray the Lord, the words of our hearts and the, and the words of our lips really shall be about giving you glory. They shall be about giving life. Oh God, even in this season when we're learning about offense, I pray the Lord, you shall help us. Oh God, help us because we can't do this without you. And our desire is that Lord, you will create in us clean hearts and renew the right spirits within us that we may worship you. You created us to worship you, Lord, and, and that's what we have gathered to do this day. Be glorified, Jesus. We love you, Lord.
those who worship the Lord, who this is us, that we may worship Him in truth and in spirit. So, Lord, Lord, as we as we go into the next part of the service, oh Lord, Father, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor, oh Lord. Be magnified in our lives, oh Lord, in the way we speak the way we walk, oh Lord, in the way we treat other people. Let your light be seen through us, oh Lord. Let us worship you in truth and in spirit, oh God. Father, search our hearts, search the deepest part of our hearts. And Father, anything that does not bring you glory, oh God, anything that we have placed above the knowledge of you, Heavenly Father, today we pray that you may illuminate that, oh Lord. And Father, that you may create in us a clean heart and a right spirit with you, oh Lord. Father, we magnify you honor you. And it's in Jesus' name we have praised and worshipped and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you so much, worship team, for leading us in a time of worship and praise. And welcome to Church God's People. We're so, so happy that you're here. My name is uh, Pastor Moredi Wanjao, Pastor M, and I'm the senior pastor of Mavuno Church. For all our visitors, we're so, so grateful that you, you chose to worship with us this morning. And my goodness, uh, if wherever you're watching from, uh, if you're watching this uh, message, uh, if you would just go online to, our, uh, to the link on your, uh, on your screen right now, uh, this is how we get to know who's watching, where you're watching from, so that we can offer pastoral support even to our online community. And so please uh, click on that link uh, or find that link. It's on our Mavuno Church uh, website and it's uh, uh, watching at home, Mavuno at home. And what we want you to do is just tell us who you're, uh, where you're watching from and who you're watching with. And it just gives us a sense of how to care for our distributed congregation across the world. We want you to do that every Sunday because it gives us a sense of who's worshiping with us. Uh, and my goodness, uh, just keep something to keep in, uh, an eye on over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, July the 7th to the 9th, the Fearless Summit is coming. Uh, I'm so excited about the Fearless Summit. One of the things that's most exciting for me is some of the people who are going to be speaking. Uh, one of my great friends, uh, Bishop Titus Masika, if you've ever heard the man speak, uh, you want to be there. He's going to be one of the people just sharing his story, talking to us about how God can use you to start a movement. Because uh, uh, the whole theme of fearless this year is limitless uh, how to turn our passion into a movement of the kingdom that's really what we're going to be talking about uh, Apostle Moses Mukisa is going to be speaking uh, from Worship Harvest Church I'm telling you there's some really crazy good speakers uh, who are going to be there but more than that I'm excited about the fact that the family of Mavuno and our friends from across the world are going to be gathered with us at Hill City uh, from different nations and we're just going to spend those three days uh, in a time of listening to God and hanging out together in learning together and allowing God to just start a movement within our hearts. And so I want to just ask you, take some time off work. It's one of those things. If you're going to take time off for anything this year, Fearless Summit is it. So 7th to the 9th of July, make a, mark the date and ask for the time off and plan to be with us. We can't wait to see. You can actually register uh, on the website uh, on the link that's on the screen. Now I want to just uh, pray for us as we prepare to give uh, of our tithes and our offerings. Some of you are preparing to give towards uh, the, the Free the Future campaign, which is the building, uh, the, the campaign that we're using uh, to get uh, to be able to pay off the mortgage on our Hill City headquarters uh, and I, I want to just uh, pray for us one of the thoughts that comes to mind as I think about our giving today is a story that really struck me the first time I read it uh, it's a story of King Solomon and his incredible generosity I mean this guy he was he had just been made king and he was a king of a general he was a son of a generous king uh, he had done, uh, his, his father David had done some great things just preparing for God's temple to be built. He had put a lot of his reserves aside for God's house to be built. And so Solomon had actually everything that he needed to build the temple of God. He had everything he needed to worship God with his father had provided. But Solomon does a crazy thing. And the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 4, it tells us the king, this is Solomon, he went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices 
for that was the most important high place. And Solomon, here's what it says, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. I mean, that's insane. I mean, that's an enormous amount of wealth. It is incredible, the kind of, he just was like, God, I'm going all out for you. I'm not just giving a trifle, I'm not just giving a token. I want to give generously, generously, sacrificially. And then verse five, look at what it says. It says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God asked him, ask for whatever you want me to give you. <laughs> it's like God watched this guy give and he's like, dude, what is it you want? It's like, 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 ask me, ask me. This is the only time you hear God saying that to somebody. Ask me for whatever you want for that you want me to give you. And you know the story after that. But the most important thing for me is that my generosity catches God's attention. My generosity catches God's attention. I believe that God is honored and pleased with our generosity. And I just want to say that there are many of you who've been generous over the years. You've given sacrificially to God's work at Mavuno Church and elsewhere. And I know that God, it catches God's attention when we're generous with His resources for His work. And so even as we pray right now, I just want to speak a blessing over you for your generosity in giving. Father, I thank you for this congregation of Mavuno Church. I thank you for the many who are part of the online congregation. I thank you for the many who are in uh, the discipleship groups, even the ones that happen online. I thank you for even our visitors who are joining us today. And I thank you that, Lord, you're challenging us and starring us, that it catches your attention when we are generous with your resources for your work. And I'm praying that, Father God, you would continue to bless, bless the work of our hands. Bless the generous people of this church. Bless all who have chosen to just make this a place where they contribute and they join in the work that God is doing. And I pray that Lord, the Lord would continue to bless you and increase your store, your harvest, so that in every occasion you will be able to even be more generous to the work of God in your generation. And so, Father, bless every family here. Bless their children. Bless the careers represented here. Bless the work of our hands as we seek to serve you and to bless you and to be kingdom financiers in our generation. And so I pray God's blessing upon you. And as we come, Lord, as we give, and even as we come to your word now, I pray that, Lord, you'd, you'd widen our hearts, stretch our hearts, prepare us for the deposit you want to put in us, the spiritual word you want to feed us with. For I pray this in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. And God's people say it together, Amen. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's so, so good to be here listening to God's Word today. We're here to uh, learn, to grow. His Word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And my name is Pastor M, uh, Senior Pastor Mavuno Church. I'm bringing God's Word to you today. We're in the middle of a series right now. It's called No Offense. And we're talking about how to deal with offense. My goodness, I've had so many great testimonies from our discipleship groups all across uh, our different campuses. Uh, as people have just been processing this whole uh, this whole stronghold that is such a major one in our culture today and what God is teaching us about letting go. By the way, I've been hearing such great testimonies about people taking action, families uh, taking action, beginning to have conversations that they didn't have before as they are working to break the stronghold of offense. We've talked about the dangers of offense. We've understood it's a trap that the enemy uses to keep people from their destiny, especially the children of God. We've gained great perspective on offense. When people offend us, we need to understand that no human or demon can ever get me out of the will of God. I'm the only one who can keep myself from my destiny. Uh, that's the way it is. And so just understanding that I don't cooperate with offense. I don't work with offense. I work against it because I don't want it to ever come between me and my God-given destiny. And last week we looked at the story of, of King David and we learned about him and his spiritual father Saul and how he was able to let go. We talked about the fact that we must let go and let God. And if you've missed any of these messages, by the way, you can find them online. Just go to www.mavunochurch.org on our YouTube page, or, 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 or our YouTube page, and you'll be able to find uh, links to these sermons. So today we're in week four, 
And we're still walking this journey uh, of learning how to deal and break this spirit. And I'm so glad you can join us as we walk this journey. You know, let me just say this. To be honest, one of the key issues that many struggle with when it comes to offense, and I remember having a conversation with one of my friends recently, and they said my big issue when it comes to letting go of people, uh, of, of this whole conversation we're talking about letting go, uh, just letting, let, letting offense not become an issue in my life. He said the issue is the issue of justice. An issue of justice. I mean, it seems so unfair that someone can act badly, hurt me, say cruel things to me, and then nothing is done to that person. Like they get away with it. And then you ask me to let go. <laughs> it's like, my goodness, that just seems so unfair. Isn't it rewarding bad behavior? Isn't it becoming an enabler? Haven't I become part of the problem when I don't hold them to account in that way? I mean, you know, it's interesting because our culture calls us, teaches us that that's our job, to call out people who behave badly, to talk about them on Twitter or Facebook. If it's very spiritual people, to, ha to share about them in our prayer group and start a whole prayer chain uh, talking about the things that were done to us. I mean, it's interesting because the, the motivation for doing this usually is to make sure they never do it to yourself or to anyone else again. And you know, in a sense, it makes total sense. It makes total sense because thinking about it, it actually makes sense to put people to account in that way. And that's why I believe that the message of Jesus is completely upside down. It's completely radical and counter to the wisdom of our world, the way we think and live today. You know, I think we read it so much, and I come to realize I read the Bible so much as a pastor and as a Christian that sometimes the offense of it just goes away. Like I, I start glossing, I start reading what I want to read as opposed to what's actually in it. Because there are some things in the scripture that are just offensive. Honestly, when you think about it, when I read the story of Jesus, I always think that if I'd been alive in his days, I would have been one of his guys. You know, I wouldn't be like those Pharisees. I think I'd be one of those guys who's walking around with him. And I mean, I'd have been like, I'd have been the guy who when he says, follow me, I'd stop everything. Of course, it's Jesus calling. I'd follow him. Uh, and of course, I wouldn't be like those Pharisees who are so stuck up doing their thing. But let me ask you, have you actually read the stuff that Jesus said? <laughs> it wasn't easy to follow Jesus. I mean, his longest recorded sermon, Matthew chapter 5, he says some crazy things. He says in Matthew 5, verse, uh, my, M Matthew 5, Verse 38, he says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Come on. Like, really, Jesus? <laughs> Seriously? I mean, like, I'm waiting for the twist because you can't really mean what you've just said, right? It's like, are you saying that if someone does me wrong, I shouldn't fight back? You're saying that I should just let it go regardless of how they've hurt me? And Jesus is like, you haven't even heard the sermon yet. Hold on. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek... Turn the other cheek also. <laughs> You're like, Jesus. Like, instead of defending myself, I turn the cheek to make it easier to hit the other side. Like, that's sick, man. That's not, that's not even the thing that's done. But Jesus is like, I'm not even finished yet. He goes on in verse 40. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give them your coat as well. <laughs> so, so, okay, we're in court. The guy is suing me. He wants my shirt. He's like, dude, you owe me money, I want that shirt. And you're like, by the way, I have a coat which goes very well with that shirt. Eh? So I just give you, have both. <laughs> it's like, are you insane? Like, Jesus, are you nuts? And then Jesus says, hold on, verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. So what, basically what he's referring to, the, the Roman soldiers, because uh, uh, the Palestine was uh, colonized, the Jews were colonized. The Roman uh, soldiers had the authority to commandeer anybody. Even your dad. I mean, if a guy is walking around, a Roman soldier could come. Come, grab this load for me and carry it for me. And they were allowed by law to take you at least one mile, 1 1.6 kilometers. And then after that, he would stop and look for the next guy. And then say, come. And it doesn't matter what you are doing. It doesn't matter whether you're in the middle of your business. It doesn't matter. He could commandeer you. And of course, the Jews hated that. And Jesus is saying, the guy has just reached there. He's looking for the next guy. He said, by the way... See, it's just a mile. I can take you another mile. Stop looking for another guy. It's like, Jesus, what are you smoking? <laughs> it's like, that is crazy. Like, nobody thinks like that. Why would anyone think like that? And then he says, come on, guys. Verse 42. Give to the one who asks you. Of course, Jesus doesn't say verse 42. It's us who put the verses in the scripture. But he says, give to the one who asks you. And don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. 
So think about that guy who's always borrowing money from you. And he has, he's coming to you. You can tell, that by the way, he hasn't even paid you yet eh, for the last amount he borrowed. And you can see that look in his eyes. He's already cooking up the story to tell you next. And Jesus is like, give to the one who asks you. And don't turn away from him. Don't, don't find an re- excuse not to be compassionate for his new need that he has. You're supposed to, <laughs> you know, that guy could be playing you. In fact, he probably is, isn't he? And it's like Jesus is saying, give it to him. You know, let me just tell you the truth. I would have struggled to follow Jesus. The real Jesus was not easy to follow because the stuff he taught was quite insane. Looked at it from the culture we live in today, it didn't make sense. He taught people to love their enemies, to do good to the ones who hate them. Like, like really, just think about people who hate you. <laughs> okay, some of you are too young. You don't have people who hate you. Let me just tell you, when you live long enough, you will have people who hate you. So, so you're, that person who hates you, it's like you, you do good to them. This is not the stuff you teach when you want to grow a following, by the way. You start teaching this on social media, you will soon, people will start unfollowing you left, right, and center. And by the way, even those days, people unfollowed Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like Jesus is saying, let, go, let people get away with the evil they are doing against you. But you know, Jesus didn't just teach it. He lived it and he died it. This is how Jesus died. And today our text is Mark Mark chapter 15. Because in that passage, he actually does what he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. In Mark chapter 15, basically it's the Easter story. And we, we, uh, we were celebrating Easter not a long time ago. And I remember I was reading this story uh, in my time with the Lord, uh, just in my quiet time. And I was struck by just how unfair and unjust the story of Jesus' crucifixion and trial was. I mean, it just is crazy. If you read Mark chapter 15, I want you to read it and to read it with your imagination, your sanctified imagination. Mark, Mark chapter 15, we're going to read from verse 1 to, to, to verse 15. And here's what it says. It says, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus led him away, handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. And so then again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. I'm going to pause there, verse 5, because I think already, even just there, there's so much that we can learn. This is a tiny part of a story of a massive betrayal. You see, the religious leaders were jealous of Jesus because of his popularity. I mean, the guy was drawing crowds, much bigger crowds than they could even dream or imagine of. They also hated him because he taught things that were contradictory to their life and their teaching. So he contradicted them every, almost every chance he had. He contradicted what they'd been teaching people for years. And they wanted to eliminate him. Because they feared, uh, they, they feared that he would turn people against them. But they couldn't kill him outrightly because they feared the masses. But you know, one day, they got a break. One of Jesus' disciples decided to come to them secretly and offered to betray Jesus for a fee. And using this spy, they managed to isolate Jesus, find a time when there was no one around him, and arrest him in the dark of the night, away from the crowds. And then they did all these things that were crazy. First of all, a night arrest. Secondly, they arranged a trial, which was a mockery of justice, because the arresting officers were the same ones doing the trial. I mean, these priests who had been there arresting him were the ones now doing the trial. And then number two, they they held a trial at night, which was against the law. I mean, nobody held a trial at night. It was not allowed to do that. But they did it anyway. And then they called false witnesses to testify against him. People they knew were lying. And they encouraged them to lie and to give stories and to make up stories. The crazy thing is that it was not even a court of law. They were holding this trial in a personal house of the high priest. I mean, this was just a mess. One injustice piled on top of another. They were desperate to do anything they could to imprison this, I mean, to kill this man. And so they tie him up in Mark chapter 15, where the story we read, it tells us they take him to the Roman governor's palace. And of course, because the Jews were colonized, they, didn't have, they could try somebody, but they could not impose capital punishment. They couldn't kill a person. So they had to actually get the authority of the Romans, and only the Romans were allowed to do that. So Pilate asked Jesus, Pilate is the governor, And he asked Jesus to defend himself. Uh, His opponents are hurling one accusation after another. And and, and it's interesting because Pilate can actually read through it. When you read the story, Pilate can tell these guys are saying nothing. 
None of what they're saying is making sense. So he says to Jesus, defend yourself. You have a great opportunity to defend yourself. But Jesus makes no reply. And Pilate tells us that, uh, the Bible tells us Pilate was amazed. Why was he amazed? Maybe because this was not the behavior you expect from an accused person. Pilate had seen many people accused before him. He had seen people pleading for their lives. They knew this was a supreme court. This is a place that you could be saved in. And so he had seen people pleading for their lives. He knew that the evidence against Jesus was flimsy. And these accusers were driven by jealousy. And so he's telling Jesus, you have a chance. Speak up. Come on, show these people how foolish they are. But Jesus remained silent. I mean, if this was a movie, it would be called Silence of the Lamb. Okay, some of you get that because you're old enough. I mean, it, 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 it's crazy. The guy is just quiet the whole time. And Pilate is amazed because he knows he's being unfairly accused. Now, what do you do when people unfairly accuse you? What do you do when people say things against you that stick, that, that are just wrong? I mean, what do you do, when, especially when it's people you thought you could trust? You know, the Apostle Peter taught us some very interesting things from Jesus' example, and he gave us uh, several, several principles. I want to just talk about several things that I really believe that are so important for us that we can learn from the trial of Jesus. Uh, Mark chapter 15, that whole story of Jesus. There are certain things we must do. And here's the thing, when we don't understand these things, then offense becomes our permanent friend. So here are some things I want to really encourage you. We began the journey last week, but I want to just go a bit deeper because I believe that in this, in, in, in this passage, there's some really powerful principles that every one of us can follow when it comes to dealing with offense. The first one is to trust God. Trust God. You know, I don't know about, do you, do you ever find that you struggle to trust God when you're in the middle of an unfair situation? Yeah, like to trust that God has your back, that God is able to defend you. I think we see Jesus really trusting God in this situation. You know, there's many scriptures that talk to us about what to do in a place like this. When you're in a place where right now you just feel unfairly treated, you feel unjustly treated, you're like, but pastor, do you know what they did to me? And the first thing that I would say to you from this scripture is trust God. That's what Jesus would teach us. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 22. And it says, don't say I will get even. For this is wrong. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. Oh my gosh. My goodness, I don't even know. For a person like me, that's a hard thing to learn. Because I like to handle the matter. Yeah. I like to handle. I, I want to have a word. I want to be able to let you know how I felt. In fact, I, one of my biggest things I used to say in an argument, I don't want to, I just want you to feel how I felt. I'm not revenging. I just want you to feel how I felt. So if I f you made me feel bad, I want you to feel bad so that you can understand how I felt when you made me feel what you made me feel. Are you understanding what I'm saying? But, but the Bible is saying, no, no, no. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 34 to 35. The Lord says, this is what it says. The Lord says, am I not storing up these things, sealing them away in my treasury? I will take revenge. I will pay them back. Come on, somebody. I will pay them back. In due time, their feet will slip. Their day of disaster will arrive and their destiny will overtake them. In other words, God is saying, relax, I got this. I got this. Jesus knew that. Maybe that's why he was relaxed. He's like, God has it. God will sort it out. First Peter chapter 2, tw chapter 2, verse 22. It says, he never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted or threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Come on. This is what Jesus was doing in that passage. He's like, God's got my case. He's looking at Pilate and it's like, you may be the, the Supreme Court, you may be the governor, you may be the most powerful person in the land right now, but you know what? My destiny is not in your hands. God sees. God knows what he's going to do about the situation that I'm in right now. And then Romans chapter 12, verse 17 to 21. I really want someone to, to take note of these scriptures. I want you to write them down and even meditate on them after this. If you're still in that place where you're struggling to let go, do not repay any, anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do right what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. He says, your job is to stay at peace with people. Yeah. Relax. 
Let God do his part. But yeah, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, it it's, does. it's upside down. Yeah. It's not the way we think in the world. The world teaches you if, you, if you just stay like that, you just become a sheep. You'll be run over. I mean, people will just take, you just become a mud. People will just be stamping on you all over. But the Bible is saying, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works in God's upside down kingdom. It's like you trust in God. God has got your back. Number two. Next thing we can learn from Jesus. Stay focused on your purpose. Stay focused on your purpose. You know, the crazy thing is, many times, offense derails us from purpose. When, when, people, when people just start hurling things at you, you just end up now focusing on that as opposed to the thing that God called you. You see, Jesus had spent time before the Father. He knew that it was important for him to stay focused on his purpose. He had come to be the Savior of the world. And so even though people did all kinds of things to distract him, he knew this is God's purpose for him. Now, it, he didn't necessarily like the purpose. In fact, I love the fact that Jesus is so real. He actually asked God, take this away from me. It's not what I want. But ultimately he said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Hey, God has a purpose in your situation. God has a purpose in your situation. Jesus surrendered himself to God's purpose. He knew that God had a purpose in all that was happening. And because of that, he was able to stay focused. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3 tells us this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything off that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And here's what it says. This is a powerful thing. It says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down before the right hand of the throne of God. And he said, Consider him who has endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. He's like, Listen, Jesus knew his purpose. Yes, there was shame. Yes, there was pain. Yes, there were all kinds of things thrown at him. But he knew the joy set before him. He knew that there was a place that God had put him on earth for. Listen, the enemy is going to use offense to keep you away from your purpose. I mean, why did God allow you in that marriage? You will get so offended at your husband, you forget that there's a reason God put you in that marriage in the first place. That there's a purpose that God has. And instead of seeking God for purpose, you start seeking God for revenge. You start seeking God for all other things. In fact, you stop seeking God, you start seeking revenge yourself. You forget why you're there. Why did God allow you to enter that job? There's a reason God put you there. But many times offense is going to keep you from achieving God's purpose in that place. Why did God allow you to be born in that family? There's a reason why God put you there. And maybe like Joseph, it was for the deliverance of many people. But anger and bitterness have taken root in your heart and you can no longer achieve the purpose God put you in that family for. You know, God was able to take the betrayal of Joseph's brothers and turn it into deliverance for many. God was able to take the betrayal of Saul on King David and turn it into a man after God's own heart. And you know, here it is. Don't allow what you're going through right now to cause you to lose sight of the fact that there's a purpose that God put you in that place for. So stay focused on your purpose. Stay focused on your purpose. Number three. Now it gets a bit deep. And this is, this is actually my main, the thing I want you to forget. Because this, this one, I think, is where we see the upside down wisdom of Jesus. You know, most people would be like, you know what? Fine. I'm not going to revenge. Fine. I'm not going to track with those people. I'm not going to let them bother me. Uh, I'm going to walk my journey. In fact, I remember Winston Churchill once said, if I turn around at every dog that barks, to throw stones at every dog that barks, I'll never get where I'm going. So many of us can resonate at least until that point. It's like, you know what? I'm not going to get distracted by all those haters. Let the haters hate. Haters are going to hate, right? Yeah. So let me just do me. But I don't want you to stop there because if you stop at that point, you're still not in the upside down wisdom of Jesus. Because Jesus takes it one step farther. And point number three is repay evil with good. Come on. Repay evil with good. And here's where it gets really radical. I mean, you know the story. The, the false trial actually succeeds. Pilate offers Jesus up to be ex executed. And Jesus is tortured by a whole company of soldiers. By the way, a company of soldiers is about 600 soldiers. So he's mocked, he's beaten, he's subjected to humiliation, and they do everything they can to just cause him to just be humiliated. They, they put him on a cross. And I remember just uh, re reflecting on this at Easter and realizing, I don't know why it never struck me, that Jesus actually was 
in the most humiliated position possible because they stripped him of all his clothes. By the time the Romans are having um, a gambling for his clothes, they're gambling for his linen, his linen undergarments. That's what they're doing. So this man is hanging there naked for the world to see. The most humiliating death possible. The most excruciating agony and pain. Being insulted by people as he hangs there. They're not even feeling sympathy. They're insulting him. And what does he do? He looks at them and he says in Luke chapter 22, 23 verse 34, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Now, who does that? <laughs> Only, like, like it's insane, isn't it? Not only is it insane, it's because what's insane about it is it's actually Jesus speaking to his father. So chances are God will do what he's asking. It's like he's using his networks because he's hooked up with God to call forgiveness on the people who are hurting him in that point. It's not, a, it's not just a wishful statement. He's actually saying, God, don't hold this thing against them. Like, let them off what they're doing right now. The most painful thing he's ever been through. And he's like, Lord, I want you to forgive them. He's doing good to those who are hurting him. Now, it's so crazy. How do we even do that? I want to go back to that Romans chapter 12 uh, passage because it says something really powerful. I remember as a, young, as a young Christian reading this and just being baffled by it. It says in verse 17, Romans 12, it says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And then verse 20, listen to this verse. It says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. <laughs> he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, you know, if you've got an enemy, if you've ever been in a situation where you have enemies, and I've been in that space, that whole idea of heaping burning coals on your head is not a bad idea. It just feels like, man, yeah, that sounds like a really important thing I'd like to do to them. And Jesus says, let me show you how to heap some burning coals on your enemies' heads. Do good to them. Don't do what they expect. Because they expect you to do evil and to repay their evil with evil. I want you to heap burning coals. I want you to do something that is going to cause their conscience to burn. I want you to do something that is going to cause them to be startled. I want you to do something that will cause them to be amazed like Pilate. That you're going to heap burning coals on their head. And how do you do that? That you overcome evil with good. So what does that mean? It means that you stop seeing <laughs> that person as your enemy. Your husband is not your enemy. Your wife is not your enemy. Become their greatest intercessor. Determine that the worse they treat you, the more you will pray for them. Mm, come on, somebody. It's like, you do bad for me, I go on my knees and start praying for you. The more you hurt me, the more I pray for your salvation. The more you, you, you treat me wrong, the more I, I figure out how to do good to you. Determine that as long as you want in that, you, God, that God, as long as God wants you in that company, you will intercede for your boss. It doesn't matter how wrong they are. You will lift her up in prayer. She will experience God's love and healing because you're there. This is Jesus. It's the upside down kingdom. Let me just tell you this. It is easier to operate the way of the world. I know for sure. But Jesus says there's something powerful that begins to happen when you do the opposite, the upside down, that God is able to deliver you and turn what you're doing into burning coals on your enemy's head. First Peter 3.9 says, don't repay evil with evil. Don't retaliate insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. By the way, this is not just Jesus who did it. It's the testimony of scripture. Pay back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do. My goodness. You know, when I think about the scripture, like I said, if, if, this is when you say, you know what, let me, let me side with the Pharisees. <laughs> what Jesus is asking is upside, it actually is upside down. But he's saying, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. That's what God has called you to do. In fact, it's your calling. He says this, when it says that is what God has called you to do, he's saying, this is what your calling is. This is what your purpose is. Not to retaliate evil with evil. When you get insulted, when you get unfairly treated, you have an opportunity to pay back. It's payback time. But you pay back with a blessing. I pay back with a blessing. And you know, that's the crazy thing. As Christians, we always pay back with blessing. This is what we are called to. 
that we may inherit a blessing. And you know what this means? The next time you're unfairly treated, the next time you're insulted, the next time someone does something evil to you, my goodness, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Why? It's an opportunity for you to bless. So rather than taking it so wrong and saying, well, how could they do this? It's the opportunity to get into the upside down wisdom of Jesus and say, it's time for payback. It's time for blessing. You know what? This is what happens. When you begin to do this, you just, you, you destroy the enemy's work because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life. So instead of becoming an agent of the enemy and spreading despair and discouragement and evil, you spread good. You spread blessing. You do the opposite. And you know what happens? What, what this is saying is, you know what? The, the, the enemy wants you to retaliate, to defend yourself. But when you do that, what, you're really, what, what God does is he steps out of that situation. And he lets you defend yourself. He lets you become the one who is in charge of your destiny. But you know what? When you do that, you're just robbing yourself of the opportunity to play against the enemy, to put burning coals on Satan's head, on Satan's plans, to destroy Satan's plans for your family. Because you need to understand Satan has plans for your family. Satan has plans for your career. Satan has plans for your destiny. And Jesus is saying, listen, you know, let me tell you how to put burning coals on the enemy's heads. <laughs> Bless. Payback with blessing. Somebody say payback with blessing. Payback with blessings. Let me tell you something. There are going to be times when people will say things about you will slander you, will defame your character. As a pastor, that's happened to me many times. Many, many times. There are people, people have said things about Mavuna Church. People have said things about me personally. Sometimes they even go personal and say things about my family that are completely unfounded and true. And sometimes they even print those things. But you know what I learned a long time ago? Is that when I pay back blessing for evil, it just destroys the enemy's plans. It keeps me focused on where I'm going. It keeps me focused on God's purpose. It lets God become the one who defends me. And so the question I want to ask you is, are you going to lean on Jesus' example, live by Jesus' example, obey your calling, follow your calling? Why are you going to defend yourself? Some of you right now, you're in the middle of a messy divorce. The temptation is to even speak with the children about the situation you're in, to draw them in as your defenders, to speak with your friends and defame your spouse's character. But what if you decided this week, that instead of doing that, you're going to bless. You're going to bless. You're going to say good things about their father because that's their father. You're not going to become the one who defames his character in front of his children. Some of you are in a place right now where maybe uh, your boss has done crazy things and you're in an office place. Uh, and it's in a place where you feel like you have to defend yourself. But what about if instead of paying back evil with evil, you figure out this week, I'm going to buy them a gift. This week, I'm going to serve them. Find a way to serve. What if you could do that? You know what? This is when you move away from what is possible with the flesh and you move to what is possible by faith only. God begins to help you walk the walk of faith. And guess what happens? The enemy's kingdom around you begins to crumble. You know, Satan thought he had Jesus in a box. Yeah. Satan thought he had Jesus in a stranglehold. He thought he had got him in a wrestling hold that Jesus was going to submit. Guess what Jesus does? He pays back evil with blessing. And the Bible says that God raises him up and puts him up at the right hand of God. Listen to me. This is your turn to pay back evil with good. I want to challenge you this week. I'm going to give you a, what I'm calling the blessing challenge. Will you not do something to seriously bless the person who offended you? In fact, I want to ask you not to do something small. Do something astounding. Do something that you could only do if God was in you. And I'm going to bless this person. They've offended me, but I'm, going, I'm not even going to just send them a text. I will actually do, find out how to bless them, and I will bless them. And for some of you, maybe you might need to remain anonymous because it's not about shaming that person. It's not about trying to force them to see. You know, sometimes you can also do it with a subtle way of saying, let me just show you who's the, the stronger man here. No, maybe God might ask you as you pray about it to just do it anonymously. But find a way to bless the person who's offended you. And I'm saying this, as you choose to let go and let God, as you choose to repay evil with good, let's trust God to do something that only God could have done. Let's trust God for the evil one's plans around your family to crumble in flames as you pour hot coals on the enemy's heads. I want to challenge you. Find out 
By the way, go out, go crazy. Find out what their favorite restaurant is. Buy them a card uh, for coffee. Take them out for coffee. Don't, don't take them out. Send, send a gift to, to take them out for coffee. Purchase a gift card. Give it to them in person or leave it where they're going to find it. Decide what's the best thing to do, whether it's to do it anonymously or to do it uh, uh, to be seen as you do it. But remember, the whole idea of this is to bless them. I want to bless you. The one who hurt me, I want to bless you. I'm not going to respond like a child of the enemy. I'm not going to hit back the way you hit me. I'm going to hit back the way my father hits back. Because my father hits back with blessing. Somebody say, it's payback time. This week, I want to challenge you to bless. Bless someone. Be a blessing to someone. I want to just pray for us right now. As we receive this message. Next week, by the way, we're going to do something really special. We're going to do a prayer service. And I want to just invite you, even for you who is in the online church, would you consider watching the service with family members next week? We want to do a family prayer service. And I want to just ask you, invite your siblings, invite your parents, invite people who are in your extended family. Just send them the invite to the service. And we want to pray blessing over families. We want to pray freedom prayers over families. Next week, we're going to have a special service. We're going to hear testimonies over this whole month of families that have been transformed, of individuals that have been transformed as they have been breaking the spirit of offense in their lives. And so it's going to be a very special service and it's going to be, like I say, it's our family service. We're going to spend some time just praying for your family. So please, uh, this could be one of the blessings you do. Invite them to that service. And let's just spend some time and trust God to break bondages in our church, break bondages in our families as we pray together. But right now, I just want to conclude in prayer. Trusting that this God who is faithful, the one who we look up to, the one we trust in, is going to deliver us as we go the way of Jesus, the upside down wisdom of Jesus, as opposed to retaliating with, with blows and evil. We're going to retaliate with good. We're going to be different. This is what it means for us to be God's people. We're not going to use the logic of the world. We're going to use the logic of the kingdom. We're going to pay back evil with good. And so, Father, I just want to bless your people right now. I know there's somebody who's listening to this message and you're bringing somebody to them right now. You're bringing someone to them right now that they need to pay back this week. It's payback time. It's payback time. And Lord, you're bringing someone to mind for them that instead of paying back evil with evil, they're going to pay back evil with good. I know it's not an easy thing. And even as we do it, I don't want to, 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 to minimize it. I know that, Lord, when you've called me to do it, there are times I've had to do it with tears. Because it just feels so unfair to be unfairly treated and then to bless the other person. As opposed to letting them feel how we felt. As opposed to letting them go through the pain of what we went through. It just seems so illogical. In fact, I suspect there's someone here who's really struggling with this message right now. But Father, I thank you because you didn't just teach us these words. It's not just theory for you. You actually went through it. You actually allowed those people who accused you, you were silent. But Lord, instead of paying them back with evil, you who had the power to call down legions of angels to punish them right there, you said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And so I just pray for, our, for, for the people of this church. I pray for everybody who's listening to this message. Give us the courage, Lord, that we will do this. I'm praying for somebody right now who's in the middle of a messy divorce. I also pray for somebody who's in the middle of a difficult marriage. There's been so much offense piled upon offense. And I'm praying that, I, and I know that their response has probably been just defending themselves, seeking to keep themselves safe. But I pray that this week you'd give them the courage to be like Jesus and to pay back evil with good. I know there's somebody who's listening to this who maybe the offense has come from your parents. It's come from your boss. It's come from another source around you, a colleague at work, a betrayal of some kind. And right now, maybe it's even somebody who's borrowed money. In fact, I just sense there's somebody here who has been so offended because someone borrowed money from you and has not paid you back and has given excuse after excuse. And maybe the way you're going to pay back evil with evil, I even sense that there's someone here that God may be asking you to do this, is to actually let go of that debt. <laughs> yeah, just let it go. And instead of just being so mean or talking about it, to actually even tell the person, I bless you and release them. Let them keep it and trust God to be your provider. They're not your provider, God is. 
And so I just pray that, Lord, even as we come to this place where it's difficult to let go, but really this is what it means to be saved, that we stop trusting in ourselves and we start trusting in our God. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would give us the grace to let go and to let God and the grace to repay good, to repay evil with good. And so we bless you, Lord. I want to pray for everybody in this place. I pray that, Lord, you would heal pain. I pray that, Lord, you would turn what the enemy intended for evil into good. And Lord, we are praying that we will see Satan's work crumbling in families. Lord, there are families here that will see Satan come down and fall down from heaven like lightning. Lord, in their marriages that will see Satan's plans falling down in flames as we pour hot coals on our enemy's head, as we pay back evil with good. And Lord, this is a joy we have. This is anticipation we have. That the enemy's plans for us will be destroyed this week as we take this radical Jesus step of paying back evil with good. And so I bless you God's people right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Amen. 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 amen and amen. Purify me, purify me, create in me all